Today we are here talking with uh, philosopher John Tilson, and this is going to be unlike some of the other interviews that I've done in the school series. So John and I have decided, since we're both philosophers of education, that we're going to do semi-regular conversations that talk about, let's say, classic works of philosophy of education. We'll read the same text. We'll discuss it. But today we're going to start off with just a more broad kind of question, which is, uh, what is philosophy of education? What is its relevance? Is it important? Is it something that people should care about? So before we start, I figure we should introduce ourselves because we're both kind of parts of the conversation here. So I'm Dr. Kevin Curry-Knight. Currently, I'm a teaching assistant professor at East Carolina University in their College of Education. And John? Yes, I'm uh, John Tilson. I'm um, a teaching fellow in philosophy at the University of Warwick, and I did my PhD in the philosophy of education. Great. So maybe we should start off with the broad question then, uh, you know, what is philosophy of education? And then we could talk about kind of the value of it. So I don't know about your educational experience, but mine is that I went to a school called the University of Delaware for PhD, and I did a degree in education with focus on philosophy of education, but I was the only one at that time who was doing philosophy of education. So a lot of quantitative researchers, qualitative researchers, things like that. So, the, you know, the question that I would often get is like, you know, like, it, you know, um, and what is the value of what you do? How does it fit in with what we're doing as quantitative researchers? And even here at East Carolina, um, it's, you know, mostly qualitative and quantitative research. And um, I think I'm one of two uh, philosopher, uh, philosophers of education here. So uh, if we have to defend philosophy of education and, and talk about what it is, and then maybe talk about how it fits in with all of the other research, you know, how do we do that? Okay, yeah, really interesting to hear about your experience. Um, so when I uh, sort of came to philosophy of education, I came to a reasonably big department. So I think there were five full-time philosophers of education, there were many PhD students, there was a whole MA course on the philosophy of education, um, which I was a part of. And so I never really had that experience of being on the fringes, uh, so to speak, um, or at least if I was in the fringe, I was in the center of the fringe movement that didn't really know what was going on in the center. Sure. Um, so I didn't have quite the same uh, experience of that. Um, but certainly that was a feeling among people there. I, I mean, I remember a philosopher of education called Chris Martin, who um, compared philosophy of education within the education department to um, the characters in Ghostbusters at Columbia University working on the paranormal activity and having to defend their discipline. He, he felt very much like that. Um, yeah. So I, I just don't understand why anyone would uh, be taken aback by the existence of philosophy of education or the point of it. It's certainly right. no more questionable than the rest of philosophy. Um, right. And I don't think that's very questionable itself. So in, in so far as you think that um, there's something worth measuring um, or uh, in a quantitative fashion, um, it seems to me that you need to determine quite what it is you're measuring and, sure. um, and what sorts of evidence could be um, counted in favor of proving one hypothesis over another hypothesis um, or disproving one hypothesis. Um, and these seem to me to be quite distinctly philosophical questions. Um, and then there's uh, sort of questions of value. I mean, so, I mean, you, you might want to uh, determine whether something is the case, but then you need to ask, well, would it be so bad if it was the case? Or would it be particularly right. good if it was right. the case? And these sort of right. uh, value questions that are debated in a standard philosophical way. Yeah. So it seems to me that um, whenever you do quantitative or qualitative um, investigations, you're going to have philosophical um, uh, commitments in doing that. And the, philo right. the, the philosophical level just sort of opens those up to inquiry. Um, it's perfectly acceptable to have commitments, and it's even perfectly acceptable to have roughly unreflective ones. People do need to do have uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis. But at some point, some people are going to have to start to think about the presuppositions involved in the quants and quals research and right. think they're, whether they're good commitments, bad commitments, um, right. plausible, implausible. Right. Yeah, I guess that's kind of, uh, it's similar to how I thought about it when people would ask a question like that. They would never ask it, you know, like offensively, like, give me an answer, give me an answer. But it was always kind of, I'm not sure what you do. Uh, so I, I would always, yeah, explain kind of like, so I, I feel like, um, 
that first part that you talked about, like figuring out what what it is that, let's say, if you're measuring something, figuring out what it is you're measuring, is, I, I mean, philosophers, I think, consider that a more philosophical task. But in my experience, a lot of quantitative researchers often somewhat obvious. Like, so uh, let's think about something like general intelligence uh, or the concept of G, the concept of IQ. I um, agree with you, I think, that, uh, you know, you have to figure out what it is you're actually measuring. What it is? What is this thing that it is G? I my experience is that psychometric researchers often kind of see that either as an obvious that it's not a terribly important question um, in the sense of as long as we know that we're measuring something that's reliable and valid, um, we don't really have to think too much about exactly defining its borders. Um, and it, maybe, if anything, philosophers will overthink it and, and jam us up. So we're going to go ahead and do our thing. And then mm. philosophers can puzzle over the, for the precise borders of general intelligence. Mm. So how, how convincing is that, are we asking? Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. Because um, so if you think about the science of heritability, let's say um, before genetics came along, there was this you know, evolutionary theory was coming about before there was this concept of genetics. So you had this idea that things were heritable biologically, but you didn't really have any way to measure how uh, the mechanism by which it worked. And I feel like people didn't really think that was too much of a problem because all you had to know was that the thing was heritable and it was demonstrably heritable. You didn't really have to puzzle over well, what mechanism is making that work and, you know, how do you that so I feel like you know general intelligence is kind of I think that's what people's response is is that yes. okay well how do we know we're measuring something that actually looks like it's a thing um, and it's debatable whether general intelligence is mm -hmm. we don't really have to think too much about what the borders of general intelligence are we just have to know that we're measuring something and at some point we'll be able to refine what it is I I don't know how convincing that is um, so it, in something like that, do you think philosophy has kind of power to be able to kind of define the contours and think about, okay, what is general intelligence? What, is, what are its limits? Things like that. Like, what do you think is the role of philosophy in something like that? In, in uh, talking about IQ testing, uh, what can yeah. philosophy do? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess um, what philosophers want is a sort of a, a general account of what it is you're doing, um, how it is that your findings um, relate to one another um, and what they show and what sort of uh, rival explanations are available to uh, explain the, the different data sets. Sure. Um, I guess if we're talking about um, what general intelligence is, um, uh, one thing you might want to do is some conceptual analysis to know quite what it is that you are interested in and what sorts of things you aren't interested in. Um, and okay and how different phenomena relate to each other under different labels. So that you just want to get a, a clear idea of the conceptual terrain so that you know the, right. the sorts of things you're interested in, the sorts of things you aren't interested in. Sure. Yeah, so, um, and not to keep going on the like general intelligence track, but like an example I could think of that would be, um, I see a lot of researchers have debated things like intelligence, a separate kind of intelligence, or is it a talent? It seems like that's almost a, a philosophical question. Like, what do we want to call it? Is Because we all know, or I think we know, that like the ability to write a good song is very different from the ability to perform a math equation. Um, so the, the philosophical question is almost seems to be, do we want to call the ability to write a song a, a type of intelligence? Do we want to call it a talent that's not really an intelligence? Uh, stuff like that, and it seems like that that almost has to be a, a philosophical question because you're not there's no data that you can use to figure out whether it's an intelligence or whether it's a talent. Mm. It seems like those are descriptive labels, you know. Yeah. Um, so get, getting clear on uh, the terminology, so where where terms are correctly used, where they're incorrectly used, and that you're using terms consistently along with other people, so that you're not talking at cross purposes. Uh, this is a sort of a foundational. Um, level of uh, discussion where you need to get your terms clear before you continue on and if you haven't done that things can get quite messy and muddled later on and people can be talking at um, cross purposes. 
Um, but this is something you could reasonably term a philosophical um, inquiry. Um, when you were saying that data is completely irrelevant to this, um, well, it, it sort of turns into common usage. It might be a good place to start talking about things where you're quite interested in what the relationship is between a talent and um, a form of intelligence and mm -hmm. how the two relate to each other. So you might just start off with common parlance and say, okay, how are people using these terms? Um, and, uh, and trying to notice where perhaps there might be uh, different senses of the term, where the same term gets used in two different senses. You go, okay, well, although it's exactly the same word, it's being used in two different senses, and we need to be very careful that um, people aren't talking at cross purposes when they use that one term. Um, in other cases, it might be that they've got um, two different terms, but they really mean much the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, get, get a little bit clearer about that. Um, mm -hmm. So trying try to uh, get clear on your, your nomenclature is, is very important. Um, and how you do that is roughly through common usage and trying right. to see where there are um, inconsistencies and consistencies. Sure. Um, yeah. Trying to do some definitions as, as precisely as possible, um, but sort of being aware that um, definitions uh, are often uh, incomplete and uh, perhaps incompletable. Uh, so that you can't give necessary and sufficient conditions for every term you want to apply. Right, right. So, and then you mentioned a second um, thing that philosophy does that really not many other you know, disciplines can really do, is really think about kind of the values in any particular, you know, so if you, if you, if you want to, if we want to measure some things and we come to a conclusion about, yes, this treatment is effective or this treatment isn't effective, um, the value question is oh, like, okay, now what do we do with that? What do we do with that information? Um, and I, I think you've been working, you know, some on some stuff with, um, I guess, religious education. Um, it, so, I, I mean, I'm sure you have a lot of occasion to think about kind of values questions in that kind of, uh, I guess, in that context. So, yeah, I talk about kind of um, I, what you do in that sense, like when you're talk, thinking about religious education, like what are some of the questions that you as a philosopher of education are kind of considering that you don't think are maybe best equipped to, uh, to analyze? Yeah, so, um, so I might just talk a little bit about uh, my PhD thesis. Sure. Um, uh, so the sorts of the sorts of questions I was interested in answering there, and the sorts of ways in which I, I hope to go about answering them. Um, so the first thing is I, I, philosophers love distinctions; uh, they're just the most pleasant things in the universe to sort of like draw a nice sharp distinction. The sharper, the better, and if you can come up with mutually exclusive and exhaustive uh, distinctions, that's just about the most satisfying thing in the universe. Um, but so may, maybe not quite like that, not mutually exclusive and exhaustive, um, but a good distinction, I think, is between formative influence on the one hand and behavioural influence on the other. Yeah. Um, formative influence I'm going to define as being um, any kind of influence over who you are as opposed to what you do. And then behavioural influence is influence over what people do. Uh, there's um, uh, Taylor and Sunstein uh, talk about nudges a lot, and it's often unclear whether they're talking about formative influences or behavioural influences. I don't think they make that distinction very clear. I don't think they're very mindful of it uh, in their book Nudge. Um, but a very obvious example of a behavioural influence would be in the cistern, in the urinal, um, when you go into the toilets, if in, in the men's urinal, you might have um, a little fly painted onto the urinal, and guys will, or, yeah, yeah. and this is going to be a behavioural influence. It doesn't change who people are, but it just changes what they do in a very sort of short-term way. Now, you might uh, give uh, someone a lot of uh, these kind of influences so that when you take the fly away one day, you no longer need the fly for the guy to aim at the urinal correctly. Mm -hmm. um, crass example, probably empirically false. Um, but this is the sort of um, uh, thing where, where behavioural influence can have a formative influence ultimately. Um, but what I was very interested in was the ethics of formative influence. So when it's um, what sorts of formative influences you ought to aim for and um, which are, is impermissible to aim for. Um, right. Here you get, so I've already 
So I, what's coming through, I hope, here is uh, sort of the importance of categories. Uh, so when I'm starting to talk about what you ought to aim for and what you oughtn't to aim for, now we need some categories about um, the, accept the permissibility or impermissibility of behaviour. And, and one good one is uh, what's impermissible must not be done, um, which, right. is, um, which can be just a, a flipped version of what's essential, obligatory. You know, it's impermissible not to do it or it's impermissible to do it. Um, right. they, they've seen roughly the same thing, just sort of inverted. Um, but then you get a category, the, the super irrigatory, which goes beyond what's permissible, one, uh, right. beyond what's impermissible, permissible. Um, it's permissible to do it. You're not required to do it. It's not impermissible to do it. But it's very good if you do do it. It would be a wonderful right. thing if you do do it. But it's above right. and beyond the call of any duty. Right. Okay. Um, and so separating out the sort of different categories of uh, behavior is very important here and uh, contestable as to how one ought to do this. Um, right. uh, then, um, so I, then you want to perhaps come up with some kind of an account of when it is that you really ought to do something, when it is you really oughtn't to do something, and when it would be a good thing to do it, but it's not required of you. Right, um, right, sure. How yeah. do you begin to, to fill that in? And yeah, there's all sorts of interesting ways of doing that. And then right. uh, ultimately, I want to apply this kind of superstructure to questions of religious influence, so influence over what children think about religion, right. and uh, um, yeah, pretty, pretty much that. Like what children right. so, so that's the kind of stuff that, I mean, you could, obviously you would use quantitative and qualitative data in pursuit of some of these, but data by itself can't particularly answer those questions. So it seems like, I mean, it seems like if we're going to defend philosophy of education, it's more like, um, I mean, it's really philosophy as a method. Philosophy is a method of evaluating and formulating uh, uh, good arguments and identifying bad arguments, making distinction you need to make, then formulating your arguments and trying to convince people that way. So it's almost, I mean, it seems to me that if you're going to defend it, I mean, philosophy of education is that, uh, the idea is that we're kind of, I guess, uniquely skilled in a sense at looking at underlying arguments, um, things, whether it's IQ testing, religious education in schools, where's the limit, things like that. I don't think other professions can really do that as well. But you did mention, um, and this, I guess, brings me to another question. Um, you mentioned Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler and their book, Nudge. And of course, Thaler is a psychologist Sunstein is a legal theorist, economist. I, I'm not sure which. I think he's a legal theorist. So one of the things I notice is that sometimes you can read an economist or a legal theorist, a psychologist. I have this experience with people like Jerome Bruner all the time uh, when I read him. And it looks, it feels like what they're doing is philosophy a lot of times, even though they're obviously it's packed with empirical stuff, but they're doing philosophy. So when Jerome Bruner talks about you know, um, the uh, importance of cultural factors on education and why people need to ex uh, look at education as kind of a transactive process between culture and the individual. It almost seems like what he's doing is is as much philosophy as what philosophers are doing. And maybe Thaler and Sunstein, I mean, you might say the same. It, it feels like they're doing as much philosophy as anything else. What do you think? Well, I, th I think that um, perhaps you and I do as much physics as the physicists. We just don't do it well. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, um, so, we're, we're, you know, in, in the way that uh, human beings generally um, make judgments about what other people are thinking, um, they do what you might call folk psychology. Um, you, could, you could say that folks do folk philosophy. Um, what philosophy is, is a discipline, is that uh, auspice under which one becomes more reflective about the philosophy one does, more mindful of the kinds of arguments that have gone before, the kinds of considerations that are being weighed up, um, and uh, does it hopefully better than they would had they not had that training and had they not had these sparring partners to do it with and um, haul them up. Uh, when they better have. Well, you, said, you said, you know, hopefully they're better than if they hadn't had these. So better how? Like, um, what would be the, like, let's say, you know, someone who does, uh, studies philosophy of education and then someone who doesn't. I mean, why do, we, what do we mean by the first hopefully being better for having studied? 
Okay. So I think, I think one immediate way in which you can be better is that you can be self-consistent. Um, uh, so you can be mindful of what your commitments are and you can see where your commitments conflict. Um, and I think that's just a minimal requirement of any kind of rational discipline. If discipline is going to be worth anything, it's got to be um, the sort of place within which one becomes clear about what their commitments are and when they might come into conflict. If you lose that, you lose any kind of credibility as a discipline at all. Um, so I think that's the first thing. Um, and the next thing is going to be, um, there's going to be other standards than mere self-consistency. Uh, there are sort of an infinite number of uh, positions you, you can have which are going to be self-consistent. Some of them are going to be more realistic and some of them are going to be less realistic. Um, so it might be that Kantian theory is incredibly self-consistent, but it might be um, unrealistic in terms of its psychological commitments to what human beings are capable of. And right. here you've got um, uh, sociology, social psychology and psychology um, coming in and sort of checking whether philosophy is really um, credible in terms of its uh, presuppositions it's about the empirical world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, equally, I think it works the other way around when, when you're talking about psychology. Psycho psychological um, tests might be um, incoherent in terms of what they're actually looking for in the first place. So Kant is right. incoherent, he's just wrong if, he, if he's pulled up short by empirical psychology. Empirical right. psychology um, needs to be coherent in the first place and that's where philosophy can help out. And then afterwards yeah. the facts can come in through empirical research. Um, yeah. I, think, yeah. I think they are dependent on one another to be uh, to be worth their salt. Um, so, in what other way yeah. can you be self consistent? Um, I don't know. That's a, a good question. Um, um, but, well, I would also add. I would also add there that um, one of the benefits I think of philosophy of education, and you know, I teach undergrads as as you have. Um, and I tell them that one of the things, especially if you're going to be a, a teacher, is um, philosophy helps you to get clear on what it is you're doing. Like a lot of times we'll do stuff in education and we don't really think about why we're doing particular things the way we're doing them. And of course, like you said, or should we be doing it in a way? So I give a lesson to my students that I think is kind of, um, kind of steeped in, in a, a philosophical approach. When we talk about, you know, why do we use letter grades? Um, and I just open it up for discussion. What are the purposes for using letter grades? And students come to the realization that we use letter grades for a few purposes. We use letter grades, first of all, to indicate, um, you know, if you get a C, you know that you can improve to a B, you know that you can improve to an A. We use grades as a motivation. Uh, if you want an A and you get a C, obviously that pushes you up higher. We also use grades for a sorting kind of purpose. So employers and other people look at your transcripts so that they can weed out the A's from the C's um, and then that gets us talking about, but wait a minute, um, does the sorting purpose of education maybe kind of conflict with the mastery purpose of education? Like if I have a class of 30 brilliant students and they all get A's, but my department chair wants me to sort the good from the bad, I can't do that and have the grades actually reflect mastery. So, I mean, they're almost starting to think about like, okay, when I give, when I give or work for grades, what is it that I'm doing? Um, and should I be doing it? I mean, should it be about mastery? Should it be about sorting? I feel like that's that's philosophy. I don't I, I don't think um, d disciplines like history they can tell you the history of, of grades and how grading came about, or you know, um, psychology could tell you the psychological effect that grading has. Um, qualitative research or quantitative research can tell you the empirical effect that grading has, but philosophy seems the only discipline that can really say, okay, but but why are we doing it? And let's get clear on why we're doing it and should we be doing it that particular way yeah so um i i certainly think that um philosophy isn't only done by philosophers and it's not only done in philosophy departments so that um every other discipline is going to have its philosophical commitments um in terms of what can is exist in its ontology what sorts of things it thinks are out there um, what sorts of things it thinks are possible, what sorts of things it takes as evidence of one thing rather than another. And apart from all of this, talking about how they think the world is, there's also questions about how they think the world ought to be, and they're going to have commitments uh, there. 
um, often in sociology departments and um, uh, education departments, you're going to find people with political commitments um, and uh, ways they think that education should operate. And uh, maybe those um, beliefs are very well considered, uh, maybe they're not always, um, but the point is that they, they can be and have been uh, um, put to a rigorous um, investigation and discussion and argument. And that sort of discussion is done in, in education departments. Um, of course, cross-disciplinary uh, in, uh, discussion is very important. And you can get philosophical insights outside of philosophical departments, just as you can get psychological insights in philosophy departments rather than um, psychology ones all of the time. So that there is a great deal of cross um, pollination between uh, people within different disciplines, university departments. Um, right. I mean, so, so the borders of philosophy of education, then, I mean, it sounds like we're saying, and I agree, that, I mean, you get philosophy in other departments just like you get psychology and, and sociology and whatnot in philosophy departments. Um, does, it, does it make sense then to separate philosophy of education as like a separate kind of sub-discipline? Because we call it a sub-discipline. I mean, um, I'm in a college of education where there are, you know, um, qualitative researchers, there's people who specialize in literacy, and then I, I specialize in philosophy of education. Does, does that make sense to kind of partition philosophy of education out from those other disciplines? I've never been sure it does, because like I said, when I read Jerome Bruner, or when I read Thaler and Sunstein, I feel like a lot of times it's really difficult to distinguish, like, if you didn't know that they were psychologists or economists, uh, and vice versa, some philosophers, you might think they're sociologists or uh, so does it make sense to partition out philosophy of education as a subdiscipline? Yeah, I mean, some of those uh, some of those distinctions are almost going to be um, not very good <laughs> in terms of working out what the person does. So um, they might be more identity markers. Um, so, for instance, um, I m might this year have become a lecturer in an education department could very easily have happened. Um, and I might still have uh, defined myself as being a philosopher because I did a philosophy undergraduate degree and a, uh, an MA and PhD, even though I'm teaching on the same program that someone who, who actually did get the job um, might have come from a very dis different disciplinary and background and but be teaching the same thing. But because of their sort of training and um, they think of themselves and identify themselves in this way, and it might, that might be quite shallow. It might be psychologically significant, but in terms of what you're doing, there's no difference. Um, now, I think that was what was interesting when you sort of listed the different disciplines there. One of them was that there are experts in uh, literature. Um, and I guess you're going to be an expert in literature, just a very narrow subset of the, of the literature. Sure. You know, sure. broad yeah. of interests or something. So how, how you do divide up disciplines is an incredibly interesting question. I think a philosophical yeah. one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Which kind of brings us full circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think that it's a good sure. way to start talking about disciplines is to distinguish between objects of study on the one hand and methods of study on the other hand. Right. The objects of study in psychology are roughly going to be the human mind, or or human behaviour. If you want to, if you want to be a ha more behaviourist about it, um, right. and then other other subjects, uh, literary theory. Is it going to have an object of study? I, I guess literary texts, just the written word. Perhaps they might want to expand it out and just say text to core. Um, and you wonder, well, what, what's the scope right. of the text? Can a planet be a text? Um, something like that. If it is, then it looks like it's just become physics. You know, like what, what you're going to choose as your uh, subject of studies is going to be a first question. Um, and then a second question is going to be the sorts of um, uh, methods you're going to use to inquire about it. Um, and it seems that philosophy is, is pretty distinct right. um, uh, about what its object of study is. Um, it seems pretty inclusive. It can be interested in time, uh, moral, uh, the, the, the mind, um, the, um, the existence or non-existence of the future, God, the, the ultimate constituents of the universe. Um, right. Generally, it's not going to be interested in uh, 
proving or disproving any hypothesis about it for empirical means. Um, right. Often a stage before there where, they, where philosophers think about what could be possible, um, what's a right. coherent thing to even state about the universe, what uh, sorts of concepts are incompatible, compatible. Um, right. So that's a method. Right. So that's yeah, a method to use yeah. any particular subject, right? Because you never, I mean, it's, someone says they're a philosopher, it's usually that, that uh, they're a philosopher of something. It's, it's very rare to see someone who just is a philosopher. You, you're a philosopher of mind, or you're a philosopher of, or you're a philosopher of uh, you know, moral philosophy, or you're a political theorist. Or, so it's, I guess those are all subjects, and you're just applying the philosophic method, analyzing arguments, making the distinctions like you're talking about, uh, things like that, to those subjects. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think this, yeah. Um, and, then, and then there are philosophers of philosophy. Uh, Timothy Williamson wrote a book, Philosophy of Philosophy, uh, where he's trying to right. get what philosophy is, how it differs from the sciences, for instance. Um, right. Willard Van, Van Orman Quine, right. for instance, thought that science and philosophy are in the same game. They're not really different very much at all, except that philosophy is more interested in the most general features of experience, uh, say, for instance, what is a cause? Causes are ubiquitous. They happen always and everywhere. Um, whereas a, um, a physicist would be more interested in something a bit narrower, say, a particular law of nature or a particular right. physical object and its properties. Um, sure. Whereas philosophers are supposed so to step back. It's between... Um, uh, the method, which is philosophy, and the subject, which is education, to put them together, and there you have philosophy of education. I don't know if it's the same um, where you are, but or, or in your experience where you've been, but in I know in the U.S. Um, it's weird because philosophers of whatever tend to be housed in philosophy departments. So you find in philosophy departments like philosophers of mind are housed there, philosophy of uh, law is usually housed there, political theorists moral theorists. Philosophy of education is a little different, though, because, you know, I'm in an education college, and that's just what happens with philosophy of education, is we are usually housed in our, in our subject area, not in our methodology. But other philosophers are, are housed in their methodology of philosophy and not housed in their subject area. Like, you don't see philosophers of cognition in the neuroscience department. Mm. So, I, I, is that the same uh, in your experience? Yeah, no, that, 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 that's completely right. It's, I think the examples of um, philosophers of education in philosophy departments um, are few and far between these days. Uh, so I think of Harry Brickhouse, who I think um, straddles the departments, education and philosophy department. Um, right, right. Harvey Siegel, I think he just works in the philosophy department. Um, but other than that, I'm really struggling to think of uh, people who count themselves as philosophers of education who work in a philosophy department rather than an education department. Right, philosophers of education. Yeah, I mean, there have been philosophers who have done work on education, but they, they're in philosophy departments because their main focus is other areas. I mean, like, we're probably going to at some point, you know, read, like, people like John Dewey, who were philosophers housed in philosophy departments, and they did work on education, but that was just part of their, their work, so they were still in philosophy departments. I wonder why that is, though, that... Uh, that philosophers of education are usually housed in education colleges or departments, whereas philosophers of science are housed in philosophy departments, not science departments. Now that sounds like an historical genesis question. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if it's because, I, is it because, I, the explanation that I usually hear is that philosophy of education just isn't taken as seriously as, I have no idea if that's historically but I can't think of many other reasons why it would be. Hmm. It is housed in the education college, not. Yeah, so, so, here, so in the UK, I can speak to the UK context a bit better here. So serious teacher training, as I understand it, um, took off um, somewhat in the 60s in the UK. And at the same time, it was thought that um, as part of teacher training, teachers ought to be versed in um, some kind of academic, uh, theoretically rigorous training about education. And perhaps these subjects were picked more or less arbitrarily, but they were history, 
psychology and philosophy and uh, teachers uh, during their training programs would be um, taught about uh, different things that psychologists uh, such as Piaget might have had to say about um, education and also about um, things that philosophers of education had, had to say here I'm thinking of Rousseau, Plato and Dewey really in particular. Um, there's a figure called R.S. Peters who made a, a, a big impact on um, creating a resurgence of interest in philosophy of education and moves towards putting it into teacher training programs in the United Kingdom. So it seems that um, when philosophy of education sort of um, had a, a resurgence of interest, it was in the context of teacher training. So that's why um, mm. they were sort of generated in those contexts. But you might still say, you know, look, there's been interest in aesthetics, um, uh, philosophy of mind, psychology, maths, and, and so on. These things have existed. Um, but philosophy of education has never really been a big player on that scene at any point in, um, uh, say, the last couple of hundred years when they have, when university departments have existed as they sort of exist now. Um, right. Yeah, I don't know. That is, that is an interesting question. Significantly, lots of important just, philosophers, of, of edu uh, philosophers have had a lot to say about education. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, um, the only other explanation I can think of, and that's a really good historical um, story that you just told, and because that makes a lot of sense. But I guess the only other explanation I could think of, and I, this is just, I don't know if it's right or not, but um, education is a fairly... I don't want to trivialize it, but it's a fairly small subject area to focus on because it's when you talk about philosophy of education, you're usually focusing on schools, I mean, rightly for better or worse, you're focusing on schools, and uh, that's different than like focusing on political theory because politics is a really grand subject. It's like it's everywhere. We're focusing on moral philosophy. I mean, that's a huge area. Whereas if you're a philosopher of education, you're focusing on this one institution. It would almost be like. Uh, I, I don't want to make the analogy too trivial, but it would be like having a philosophy, a philosophy of supermarkets uh, that focuses on simply the institution of supermarkets. That's a pretty small subject. So it, I guess you, maybe you could make the argument that philosophy of education is a fairly small domain because it's fo like it's focusing on a fairly small area because it's we associate it with schools. I, I'm just throwing that out there. I have no idea whether that has any merit to it at all. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, so when, when, when you think about philosophy of education, um, the first thing that sort of comes to people's minds is schooling. By education, you mean schooling, right? And then the first thing we say back to them is, no, 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 education is so much broader than that. It's not just schools. But the truth of it is, I'm most interested in schools. Uh, I, 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 I find that most interesting sort of... When you talk about education, you are talking about, but that's what people think about, like you said, so, yeah. yeah. And I think that's an incredibly important thing to talk about. I don't think it's uh, very trivial. I mean, you drew the comparison with supermarkets. I don't think that's too trivial a thing to talk about either, just because lots of people shop at supermarkets, lots of people are employed by supermarkets, um, lots of people are dependent on supermarkets for selling their produce and distributing them. Um, uh, they're, they're a very important right. part of the economy. They're a big but perhaps ordinarily invisible part of the economy because they're so institutionalized and part of our lives that we barely stop to reflect on them. But they are worthy of uh, stopping and, and reflection on them. And all sorts of uh, arguments can be brought in to discuss whether or not what they do, are doing is by various standards, good or bad. Um, discussing which standards are relevant is an interesting right. thing. Um, but, um, but the, the, these sorts of discussions, I think, are primarily going to be ethical and political. Um, what's, what's a little bit of a pity for me as uh, somebody who likes metaphysics is it's, it's hard to get into um, the ontology of supermarkets or the ontology of schools in any kind of an interesting way. That, that really isn't very special. Our schools and um, supermarkets don't to be, seem to be especially interesting um, places to start talking about ontology. Um, the schools might be interesting places to start talking about the philosophy of mind because there's concepts like learning uh, that, that are going to be specially uh, employed in those contexts. Yeah, um, yeah. One of my uh, favorite groups of philosophers, in fact, that I actually do teach students about, even in uh, classes that focus on educational psychology, this is where the line blurs, I guess, 
is the theorists of extended theorists of mind, like Andy Clark, David Chalmers, folks like that, who believe that cognition is not just in the brain, it's the brain's interaction with a whole bunch of tools. So like if I'm working on a, with a calculator, uh, their idea is that well, we should actually call the calculator part of that cognitive process. Now, that's a pretty philosophical thing, but it's, it really bleeds over, going back to the earlier point, into psychology. How do you distinguish between, I mean, the same sorts of things with it, said by the psychologist Lev Vygotsky in the 1930s, and he was a psychologist. Um, again, it kind of skirts the line yeah. there. But yeah, it, you're right. I mean, like, cognition is a, is a big part of learning. Um, I've talked about, I mean, there's a lot of philosophers who look at kind of the, the power dynamics of school situations. Like, uh, I, I, I know some philosopher folks who've worked on um, the philosophy of the, the spatial geography of schools and wow. what the spatial geography says about the, about yeah. the learning process and the power dynamic process and how that affects things and, can, can, uh, can you, you know, not things that you see in other departments. Can you say a little bit about that? Do you, do you know any, uh, any of the stuff that they said? I don't know that much. Yeah, I don't know that much about that. But so, I mean, I've gone into some classes um, where we've talked in very philosophical ways about looking at things like um, something as basic as how the, the room is set up. Um, you know, like the idea that when you walk into a classroom, you pretty much know where you're going to sit based on the role that you know you're playing. So yeah. if you're a student, you know where you're going to sit because you're a student. You don't have to think about, am I going to sit at that desk or am I going to sit at that table? Um, and then when I'm the professor, I come in the room, obviously dressed in the shirt and tie, very professorly, and I know that I'm sitting here. And kind of the power dynamics of that situation, how that affects everyone's kind of perceptions of the learning process. And um, I mean, there's some, certainly a philosophical element to that uh, because philosophy, I, I, you know, kind of specializes in um, getting those things that aren't usually questioned and interrogated. So like the moral element to why the room is set up and the way students sit here looking at the teacher and the teacher sits here looking at the students and things like that. It's uh, a lot, you know, a lot, maybe the only other discipline that might analyze it that way might be uh, sociology, maybe psychology. You could talk about the psychology of the schooling relationship, but really it seems like it's when you get in the moral aspect of that, especially, it's a, it seems like it's a more philosophical. Um... Hmm. Um, I guess one thing I wanted to mention is the sorts of things that you're sort of mentioning now um, are sort of becoming aware of the way things are and the sorts of structures that are at play in the situation as you find it in the classroom. Um, and how does one come to be aware? One way in which people come to be aware of these things is by seeing where they're absent. And here, comparative education can be uh, very important. Um, but if comparative sure. education is only going to say, this is how one culture does it, this is how another culture does it, and we're just going to compare these, you lose the teeth of the um, normative dimension of which is preferable. Um, and right. so this, this is where... Um, Philosophers want to come in, at least evaluative philosophers, and talk about well, what what values are you? What are you trying to promote? How do you go about weighing up uh, goods and bads and um, costs and benefits and um, the permissible and the obligatory and uh, and so on? Yeah, yeah, uh, right. So yeah, but uh, so but you can learn a lot from comparative education rather than merely sort of looking around a classroom. The me the methodology of looking at the classroom and trying to make the familiar strange is not going to be as effective as perhaps walking into an entire right. context where you find things that are utterly unfamiliar and lacking in the things that are. Right, right. Yeah, so so I guess, yeah, the philosopher's part in that equation seems to be looking at kind of, in some ways, maybe the ethical, the moral dimensions of why the classroom is set up as it is. Is is there, uh, is, this, is this for good purposes? Is this for bad purposes? Is mm. it is make, are there good arguments for the way it is? Are there, you know, better arguments for it being a different way or something like that. So I guess, you know, that, that's kind of where uh, philosophy, I guess, seems to, to step in there. So um, I guess kind of a, a final um, question is, so let's imagine that philosophy of education goes away and that people just don't study it anymore. Because um, in the U.S., actually, there is a real threat to what are called the foundations of education of which philosophy is a part. 
um, not being taken as seriously, especially by like legislators and things like that. They want teacher ed students to know like the data, like the, what does the science say about good teaching? Uh, that's what we want to know. We don't really need to spend a lot of time with philosophy of ed or, or things like that. So let's say philosophy of ed goes away. Are we, be are we better off? Or are we worse off? I mean, I'm sure two philosophers are going to say we're worse off, but let's try to identify like what's going to change. So I don't think your philosophical commitments are going to disappear. There's still going to be uh, uh, commitments about what is thought to be good and what's thought to be bad. But now what's not being done is that they're being uh, specified and taken as objects of curiosity to be debated and researched and compared to rival goals um, and seen in historical context um, of, of what various thinkers have thought over the, over the years um, and why they've thought it. So it just looks like we've gone unreflective um, and that any, any kind of uh, tension in our own thoughts is just going to be invisible to us and um, we're just going to be sort of pursuing policy somewhat blindly. Um, now that I think is a cost. Um, if you don't think that's a cost then I, there's nothing I could ever say to convince, convince you to you know, do your philosophy of your eyes open. Right. Right. I, mean, I guess in the U.S., and um, I, I'm pretty sure the U.K. is probably experiencing some similar things. I mean, it's becoming more and more where the school systems that exist are um, – the teachers don't have a whole lot of autonomy to do any particular thing anyway. It's, it's – uh, the school system is going to tell the teachers what to do. The teachers are going to do what they're going to do. Like, they're going to take the orders. So there's kind of almost a tension between, okay, like, I want to teach my undergraduate students to think reflectively about – the practice of teaching, but at the same time, uh, you know, legislators are kind of taking away the discretion that you have to do anything differently anyhow. So maybe if you're simply the order taker, there is no benefit to you studying philosophy of education because uh, you might come to the conclusion that some things that schools are doing are wrong. And uh, obviously that wouldn't be good if you want to be a teacher. So uh, well, I th that's a very interesting point. Um, so I think there is, you know, some real, um, some real teeth to that. So part of it is that it's almost cruel to enable people to think critically and um, to put them in a position to think about what they would do and why they would do it had they the power to change things and then saying, and by the way, you have no power. Um, now, I think that's also perhaps a little bit false. So, so, so to the extent that um, there's such a thing as collective power, and people are capable of organizing themselves in such a way that they can make their voices heard by persuading one another. I think it's never going to be true that they're completely powerless. Um, and the way in order to um, make better judgments is to uh, think reflectively about these things, have arguments with one another, try to persuade one another. Hopefully the best arguments will prevail and you can have collective movements to pursue what you think is the good. Um, and in a, I think that's very becoming of a profession like teaching where you're trying to shape young minds rather than being sort of blindly controlled by um, the political class, let's say, or perhaps the economic class, um, ec economic forces, if it's, it's not going to be just political decision making. Um, so I think there's still reason in spite of that, although I do see the force of it because it can be very frustrating um, to, to, to have have views and still be impotent to do anything about them. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think a, probably a good point to, uh, to end on. It's uh, it maybe, maybe the idea is that especially if legislators and, and economic forces are going to shape things in particular ways, maybe it is all the more important that people actually are able to kind of evaluate the purposes so that they could collectively, you know, organize to make things different or even individually take stands that are ethically or morally appropriate, whatever. So yeah. that's a, Good point to uh, end on. So I guess um, if all goes to plan, the next time we're talking, we will be talking uh, about uh, Plato's dialogue, Meno, and whether virtue can be taught. So uh, it was a great conversation, John. Thanks for doing it. We'll, we'll meet up again, and uh, good to have you on the show. Oh, absolute pleasure. Looking forward to it.